uh, see uh, the woman that Dee has become and uh, to see her life uh, flourish, as Janet was saying, for her to thrive. Um, of course, none of the stories we could tell, tell us today are without struggle. Um, and Jackie and, and Dee and her family have been through that a great deal of that as well. Um, but they've held on to a vision of the things that Janet and I were just talking about, about what is a real home. So thanks to Janet. So as Deb said, uh, our daughter's name is Diane, but we call her Dee for short. And we wanted to, or I wanted to share with you her vision of living in her own home and the, some of the struggles and the journey in how we achieve that. So that's Diane there, obviously. Okay, about eight years ago, she, uh, I'm just trying to describe her life then. And what it consisted of is going to her day service five days a week. So it was full time. She was seen as a client. Uh, she lived at home with us and she really didn't have many friends at all and very little community involvement. And she attend on weekends, she had so little confidence in mixing with people that weren't in segregated settings that on weekends she chose to do that as well. So it was all segregated settings for her. The professionals, and probably a lot of parents would understand this, um, she was labelled as a client, as a service user, and as a person with an intellectual disability, and pretty much someone to be pitied. Then as she got older, um, it got worse, because then she was described as somebody with multiple disabilities and a mental illness. She suffers from anxiety and obsessive compulsive, some parts obsessive compulsive. So there was all these labels attached to her and that's what people tended to think about when they described Dion. Anyway, when she was 18, she, uh, we sort of had in the back of our minds, my husband and myself, that she would go to um, a group home. And she came out one day and said, I'm not going to live with you and dad in, for the rest of my life and I, I want to move out of home. And I thought, oh, well, that's okay. We'll start looking at group homes. And she said, no, I don't want to live in a group home. And I don't want to live with another person with a disability. Or I don't want to live with a carer. And I don't want to live with other support people. Thought, oh, what are we going to do? So, and she said, I just want to live in a house or a place just like my brothers. In other words, normal. I thought, oh dear, there's a challenge. So two years later, Peter and I decided, well, we'd try again. So we'd sort of left this very quiet and thought, oh, she'll get over it, you know. And uh, so we thought, right, what are our options? Again, live in a group home or continue to live with us for the rest of our lives. And then what are we going to do? What's she going to do when we're not around anymore? And or do we put a unit up in the backyard? But we were also worried then that you know, what's the next stage after that? Is that just a temporary, sort of a halfway stage? Meanwhile, she said no to all of those. So we thought, now what are we going to do? And then she ended up getting a lot of more difficulties with her mental health and was at home full time. So we had her at home 24 hours a day, seven days a week. She wouldn't go outside. She just really went down. So we knew we had to do something. So what I did um, is I started attending workshops, some of them run by Deb, some run by Michael Kendrick from overseas and lots of other people interstate and overseas who were talking about the fact that they were doing some of the things that we've been talking about today. They were actually um, looking at people living in their own place and I still didn't really think that this would apply for her. but. What I did was I had the opportunity, I was very lucky, I had the opportunity to go and see some people living in their own places. And it was a group called Homes West up in Queensland and they very nicely invited some of us to go and visit them. And that really inspired me because I felt you can talk about these things but if you can see 
some of these people doing this and they had varying degrees of disability. Some were very low needs, some were very high needs. And I saw a girl that was sort of very similar in, in Diane, as Diane was. So I thought, well, maybe it is possible. So we actually dared to imagine and dream of something different from what we were being offered. So the first step was rather than have all of these negative labels, we decided the first thing was to focus on who she really is. So we looked at her interests and her strengths, gifts and abilities, and what is typical for someone of that age. So we came up after many years, you know, quite a bit of discussion, we came up with her vision and she put a lot of work into this. It took a long time, but the first priority is it had to have a lot of pink in it. Didn't matter where at that stage, but we've got pink everything. We've got pink potato peelers, we've got pink everything. So it had to be pink. So then also not sharing with a person with a disability um, and she wanted to be close to us, but not too close. And mind you, we were sort of agreeing with that one too. Um, and have lots of friends and family to visit her. So in other words, a lot of normal sort of activities that we would take for granted. Uh, living in a local community, because we're fortunate enough to be close to a community where it has lots of shops and lots of friendly, fairly friendly people that she'd got to know. Um, so rather than moving her somewhere else, and find meaningful work and have her dog at her flat. Mind you, she doesn't, she only cuddles it. She doesn't do any of the other stuff, but never mind. Um, so the first thing we had to think about was the location. We decided we had to have it somewhere that was close to where she already knew the, the community. Because it's one thing to have a fantastic place to live but it's isolated from where she knows those people, that wouldn't do for her because she's a very social person. And then it was, well, do we rent or do we buy? Now, first of all, apart from the finance side of it, um, I had listened to a few people from Queensland and they were quite strong with their advice in don't buy first up because it can take two, three, maybe more times to get the model correct. And if you've bought something, obviously you're not going to want to change that in a hurry. So um, renting, you've got that opportunity to try it out. You try the location, you try um, how many bedrooms, you try all sorts of different things. Um, and then, well, do we find a flatmate and then they go and look for a place together or do we look for a place first? And that took me a while to decide, but it was decided that we find the place first because then it is Diane's place. And then when we find a flatmate, they move in and share with her, but she has that ownership, even though it was rented, but she has that ownership of that place. And I think that has worked in experience. That's worked really well, because it's her place first. Um, what configuration? Well, that was, that's pretty basic, but we wanted two bedrooms, one for her and one for the other, but we were also conscious if the flatmate or the housemate was away or out and we wanted someone else to come in and stay overnight, they're not going to be going into the housemate's bedroom to use their bed. Um, that's their private area, same as it would be in a normal situation. So we needed somewhere where you could have um, a divan or a folding couch or something. Okay, so we had decided what we wanted to do, then we had to try and do it. So the first thing was finding the place. Now there's a few websites, they're all on the sheets anyway. We started looking. Um, and with the websites you can actually, and you probably know this, but you can put in a selection criteria of where you're looking for, what size, things like that. And then it will send you alerts via email probably every, sometimes every day, sometimes once a week, and that makes it a bit easier for you, that's all. Also, we checked with the real estate agents, not just relying on the internet, although I must say that wasn't as successful as we were hoping, um, but it's worth a try. Um, we also put out lots of um, different brochures and so on around places. 
Um, now, with the inspection, that was something that was a real learning curve for me because I've rented for years, but that was, you know, many, many years ago. And I didn't realise that it, when you go and find, you know, you find a place and you think, right, I'm going to go and have a look at that. Years ago, we used to just go and collect a key from the real estate agent, have a look at it and drop the key back. It's totally different now. You have a 15 minute window of inspection time that you can see this place. So you've got to be a bit organised. But also, you, uh, what I found was that you download the application form prior to going and seeing it, fill it in and take it with you. Get there really early because it's first in, first serve and you hand the application form to the real estate agent as soon as you walk in the door. Now, that sounds stupid, I know. But you look around, if you decide you don't like it, you ask for your form back. But at least if you do like it, she's got your form fairly quickly. So again, a lot of the time it just comes down to first in, first serve. And then the lease document itself, once, you've dis once you have been given a place, it is a good idea to, you have to put Obviously, well, we put our hus my husband's name on it because he's the one that was earning the income, so they have to assess all of that. But we also put Diane's name on it, and that then enables her to get some credit rating down the track so that if we need to do apply for something, we've at least got some sort of rating. And once you've done that and it's all signed off, then you take it to Centrelink and then they will maybe, you know, you can apply for rental assistance, but they won't look at that until you have it signed off by both parties. So, we'd found the place, we'd got it signed, we got the lease done and everything was great and it was all pink. Okay, so then we needed to find someone to share with her, a flatmate. So what we decided to do was we did not want someone um, that was just coming from a service. We wanted to look at the qualities of the person that we were looking for. Now one, the biggest thing for Diane is first of all that they can cope with a lot of pink and the second is that they have a good sense of humour. Um, apart from that, not a disability, supportive and understanding, caring, able to build on her strengths and uh, encourage in good communication. So we're looking at the type of person, not the qualifications. Because when we go, when, when I would, was going and looking at a place, I wouldn't go and look at what they did for a job, I'd be looking at what sort of person they were. Um, the big, then we looked at the roles that we were going to ask of that flatmate. So we're asking for some support. So we, we wanted them to do with Diane, not for, because Diane is very good at sitting down and not doing too much. She's very clever in some of those ways. So we wanted that encouragement that they would do it with her. Um, companionship, like other flatmates have companionship and they might just watch a DVD together or something like that. Uh, encouragement with healthy food, uh, supportive and understanding. And the main thing we wanted was for them to be able to commit to staying on the nights that Diane is in the flat and also cooking the dinner for her or getting her to help cook dinner. She's quite capable of doing the breakfast and lunch. She can zap something in the microwave or something. but the dinner is a lot more difficult um, and to be there overnight and to have some sort of relationship with Diane. Okay, so we had the personality and we had what we were asking them to do. Oh, there were other things like we were going to ask them to help with housekeeping and so on. It help, not do. Um, so then we needed to find a flatmate, so we advertised again on those websites. Um, but the most successful one we have had, us and a lot of other families that I'm involved with, is Gumtree. Gumtree is a free service and you can, a lot of young people use Gumtree. And so we found a lot of support people and flatmates from there. Diane also went around and put a whole lot of notices up on community centres, shops, universities. So that was a good thing for her to do as well. OK, 
okay, we found some people to interview. So then it was a matter of screening. We actually asked Jo Walters from Living Distinctive Lives. She will be talking about that later. It's a group, family governed group. Um, to screen them first, but I guess as a family member, you could do that. And screen them on the phone and email before you actually meet up with them, and that's important. Um, and then the next step was the interview, but we didn't involve Diane at that stage because of security reasons. You know, we're just safeguards. We just wanted to make sure that we were happy with them first before we put Diane through that. She also used to get very anxious about it, so it's better to at least get part of it done. And then the reference checks, and then the next one, we would get Diane involved. And after that, if it's still, because she was fairly definite that she didn't like them, or she did love, she loved them, or she didn't want them. Um, and so then from there, we um, had a couple of, they'd have coffee together a few times and so on, and then we'd, we'd start. Um, okay, so once we have, we've got the person, we then have a written agreement. And we wanted to put in there about the aims. In other words, we don't want it to be run like a group home. We wanted it to be like a home that we would live in. Um, the roles and the responsibilities, I've sort of gone through that anyway. And we offer them reduced rent in return for a number of hours of that support. You know, being there at night and being there at dinner time and cooking the dinner, helping with the washing, helping with all sorts of uh, things, doing the shopping with her and so on. So there's quite a bit in that, but they can still be running, you know, working in a normal position themselves during the day. It's really only the night time. So the additional costs of the utilities are all shared between them. Uh, it's important to have a trial period. Doesn't always work, so you need to have that out. And we usually make it a month. Um, and notice on either party might want to leave, so you need to put that into the agreement as to what the notice is that's required. Emergency numbers, we always just have that in the flat, so that if something happened to D, they can look in the book and vice versa, so that we've got some just a safeguard. And it's important that both parties sign it so that it is a proper document. Okay, um, once the, the flatmate's in, we then uh, like to set up a situation where you've got su some support for the flatmate. Because if you, if you think this is a person maybe that doesn't have the experience necessarily with disabilities, um, so they're coming in and there's going to be a lot of learning for them as well as Diane and us. So it's a good idea. What I usually do is I meet with the with the sort of flatmate maybe once. I start off weekly and then I meet fortnightly for coffee maybe on a weekend. So Diane's not there, and then they can say, "Look, what do I do about such and such?" Or, "Look, she's doing this. How do I how do I handle that one?" So there's lots of stuff that I know that they won't know, and I can guide them through that. Um, but then it's also important to have another person because they might say, look, I don't, I'm a bit embarrassed to say this to mum. Um, I'd rather have someone else. So we offer another person. It could be a friend, a family member, someone totally different. So they can ring them and say, look, you know, I can't stand working with Jackie, you know, or whatever. Or, you know, this is embarrassing. I don't want to talk to her about that. And that gives them that ability to be able to do that. But we also need to remember we've got to support Diane too. Um, it's hard for someone with an intellectual disability. It, relationships don't come easily. Um, what's appropriate and what's not. So we work with her as well. And obviously we have support workers coming in during the day. The, the flatmate needs to understand when they are and who they are. Because it is their home too. It's not a workplace. Okay, so with the support workers coming into the home, some of it, they just come, pick her up, and then they go out and do stuff in the community. Other times they do it in the house. So it's important to work out what is Diane's and the flatmate's role, and what is Diane's and the support worker role. Otherwise you get into a bit of a, an issue. Um, so what we've, we, we set that down so that we asked her to help the support workers helped Diane with her washing. But the main 
other thing that I wanted to, to say there is really the importance we find what works better and we've had both. We had a, a flatmate just recently who was a support worker and worked in the industry. But we found the, mo the best ones are the ones that you choose because of their personality. And sometimes it's an advantage they don't have that experience in disability because they come with certain ideas, they come maybe doing it a different way from what you want. So you're able to, if you've got the right person, you can then train or help them to work in the way you want them to work. Um, and that goes for support workers as well, but not quite so much. Um, the other thing I found as a mother was I had to keep telling myself, whose home is this? It's not mine. It's actually Diane's and the flatmates. And I found that really difficult. I'd walk in and I'd see this big mess in the lounge room and I'm saying, come on, Diane, come on, you've got to clean this up, you know, all this sort of stuff. And I just, I had to really take a step back and think, well, my standards may not be the same as hers, well, they aren't, and uh, certain flatmates have good stand, high standards in cleanliness and certain ones don't, but I have to live with that. So we have uh, our money, Diane's money, hosted at an agency, and so the family role is we do the advertising and interviews, select the workers and the flatmates. We guide those support workers and flatmates and we have team meetings. So all this is organised. Can everyone hear? Yeah. Um, and we forward on the timesheets to the host agency. So the host agency where the money sits is pu pretty much only the admin role. But the money goes from DHS to Melba. And then we take the responsibility as a family for all of the day-to-day -day stuff. But when it comes to paying the workers um, and any other invoices, Melba handle that for us and they pay them. And Melba is the legal employer of the support workers. So but they don't have anything much to do with them on a day-to-day -day basis. We do all that. So the support worker is employed by the post agency? Yes, legally. Legal. We choose them. But they are the legal employers. So that covers workers' comp, insurance, superannuation, so and so on. We advertise, we, we interview, and we choose. And then a Melba person will sign them up. Yep. And then we um, work with them on a day to day basis, and then after that, Melba <coughs> pay for them. So Diane's living arrangements are uh, now looking like this. She's, she's in the flat and she's got her family um, on one side, the flatmate living with her and support workers coming in. And outside of the flat she's got the community, her friends, her circle members, so she's got a circle of support around her. Um, and a group that's family governed, which is called Living Distinctive Lives. And that I was going to talk about, but it just, I'm leaving that all to Joe. That gets a bit mess, more complicated. Okay, so remember the slide right at the beginning where we talked about what her image or what she was thought of and what her roles were. Um, so going back, she was known as a person with a disability and she had lots of labels. She didn't have many friends, she had low self-esteem, and she attended a day service full-time and she went to segregated settings on weekends. Now, she's well known in the community. She welcomes the new shop owners. If a new shop opens in the area, she goes in and welcomes them to the Burundara community. <laughs> and we only found this out a little while ago. And she's also very good. We found out yesterday, I had uh, Alison, who'll be talking to you later. We went into a shop in Glenferry Road and she was talking to the hairdresser there and she said, uh, when's your birthday? And he said, that's Saturday, isn't it? And she, he said, no, that was the 18th. And he said, she said, something's coming up on Saturday. It's your anniversary. 
and he'd forgotten. And he was so thrilled that Diane had reminded him. And he said, oh, I have to get a present, you know, and he was, so she sort of, she, she does a lot of that sort of stuff. So because they're involved with her and they're friends with her and she's got a higher self-esteem and she lives and works in that community, she very rarely goes to the weekend segregated settings now. Um, and she has not as reliant on us. Uh, she's becoming more independent. I wouldn't say she is independent, but she's getting there. How are we going? I'm all right. Uh, community and home, there's a few pictures of her in the community. There's the butcher, she you know, frequents that, the chemists and so on. And some, a party she had at home. But that's her working out in the gym um, with her favorite personal trainer because he's a guy, um, that's, uh, you know, that's her and one of her flatmates doing just normal things like we would normally do at home. And because Diane has built up such a good uh, self-esteem self in the last few years, she's set herself a goal. She's now going to go and see, go to Graceland and she, in three years time, and she's going to see Elvis's home without mum and dad. So that's a challenge for us. But anyway, she's already saving. She's got a plan. She's got two suitcases in pink already. <laughs> uh, the Australian Human Rights Commission um, announced their 20th anniversary of when the Disability Discrimination Act was, was passed. So in celebration of that, what they decided to do was to get 20 different um, families or people to do a video of getting a better life for somebody with a disability. And Belonging Matters were very proud to, to be chosen as one of those 20 groups. And so they asked Diane and asked if they could video her in her home with her support workers and with her flatmate and doing normal stuff as, as was like in the photo with her and the butchers and the chemists, it's all those sorts of things. So that um, is actually being released on Friday of this week and Diane and Deb are going up to Kirribilli House to have the launch, which is very exciting. We're not invited, mind you. <laughs> um, anyway, there is a, a little brochure in your satchel, but what they've done is they've got a blog of each of the 20 stories on their website at the moment, and there's the link on there. Uh, after, it'll probably be early next week, I would hope, that they will have all of the 20 stories up on the website. And um, probably Diane's would be one of the very few that is somebody with an intellectual disability, and I thought that was quite interesting. Typical, wasn't it? Like, you know, when you want to find a place to live, you like go to a real estate agent. Very typical. You get on a website, you look, you work out your budget, how it's going to piece together. You want to find a flatmate, what do you do? You know, you don't call up the disability agency, you go, where do people find flatmates? Um, Gumtree was one of the examples that worked. Um, now, Dee's, so it's very typical, and Dee's life in the community is very typical. Um, it was interesting because Jackie talked about that little, uh, the 20 years, 20 stories, um, uh, you know, released on Friday. And Owen and I actually, our cameraman here, spent some time in Dee's community filming her, so you, you need to watch it. Um, but what I think we were so impressed with was that uh, Dee's sense of belonging to that community. She's not just present. Uh, she's not just accessing the community. She actually belongs to it. And um, people know very ordinary things about Dee and she knows very ordinary things about the people uh, and their birth dates. Um, and it's, it's quite amazing to watch that, but um, you know, like it is, she's very, very connected. So this sense 
that, um, you know, and I think uh, Jackie and Peter were spot on, that um, to try and sustain D in her community is very, very important because there's a whole host of safeguards. Um, now, Dee does have a number of needs. Um, she, we've talked about this a few times, you know, like um, Dee will need support always. Um, you, I'm sure Dee has become more independent in many things in her life because she's been, people have seen her potential and have encouraged her. But I think she will always, for the rest of her life, need support. Um, and uh, so the sense and that Sue, you were talking about, you know, what happens when we're no longer here is a really important piece to work out. No matter what option, right, that you choose, this option or something else, is that, you know, like we were saying before, life is more than just a roof over your head. So families need to be thinking about who's going to watch out when we're no longer here and to try and build that up. So it, it, it's not easy and it's not a panacea, but um, my sense is uh, the other thing about Dee's story is it took a long time. Like Dee stayed one night at the start and then two nights and then three nights and it's a gradual process. She still likes to stay at home. Um, and she enjoys that very much. And I know Jackie and I have had conversations about this. And um, if something happened to Jack and Peter, even though Dee's not there full time, if something happened to them, I don't think it'd be as big a leap to move into the flat full time as it would to move out of home into a whole new scenario. You know, so it's a very careful thinking around Dee, uh, her preferences, her tastes, her pace, her routines. Um, and when you go to Dee's place, you actually, that's, you know you're in Dee's place. Uh, there's nothing in there that sort of looks like a program. Um, when I visit, I feel like I'm visiting Dee, uh, not a service.